Uh, welcome to Trinity, the Linux kernel fuzz tester. We have Dave Jones. Dave is employed by Red Hat to manage the Fedora kernel team. And in addition to working on the kernel, he occasionally finds times to fix and break the kernel. <laughs> Hopefully before the users do. I'll just pass it on to Dave since we're running late and hope you enjoy the talk. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep, good. Um, so because we're running late, I'm going to have to go really quickly because there's a ton of stuff to get through. Um, so this is a tool that uh, I've been working on for um, probably six or seven years now, but it's only really taken shape in the last two or three. Um, the basic thing it does is it fuzzes syscalls. And by that, I mean it calls system calls with random arguments in random orders. So it just does all kinds of crazy things that uh, real programs tend not to do. Um, it's not a particularly new idea. It's uh, something that's been around for a long time. Um, the earliest one I could find was something uh, against uh, Unix SVR4, a tool that someone wrote called Tesis. And um, what that did, it was literally just putting the output of RAND straight into all the, the registers and calling syscalls. Um, fast forwarding 10 years, uh, while I was working at SUSE, uh, Kurt Garloff wrote a pretty much exactly the same tool and ran it against Linux. And I think this is the first time someone had done this against Linux. And uh, we found a whole bunch of bugs, really, really silly things. Um, the problem with just calling RAND, you, um, the majority of the system calls, you're just going to get en val back. So uh, once we fixed up this handful of really silly bugs, that tool didn't really do much more for a while. Um, a few years later, a bunch of different people started um, extending the idea a little. Um, instead of just feeding them brand, they, uh, sometimes they pass, say, a file descriptor or a network socket or something uh, like a, a, a malloced page. And uh, this found a whole bunch of different bugs. Um, around 2006, uh, the, the bottom one there, Scratch Me, or S Crash Me, um, that was my first sort of attempt at actually making this tool I'm talking about today. And uh, it was just an extension of the tool that Kurt Garloff wrote. And uh, it, it found a bunch of bugs. And then from 2006 to maybe 2008, it pretty much didn't do much at all because uh, we'd fixed all the, the silly bugs. So coming up to modern day, uh, almost, um, 2010, uh, I extended the tool to uh, understand a lot more parameters and types that the kernel and uh, the kernel is expecting. Um, completely parallel to me and completely unknown at the time, uh, someone at Google was writing pretty much exactly the same tool, the tool called I Know This, um, does pretty much exactly the same thing but in slightly different ways. So uh, sometimes they find different bugs. So uh, it's pretty neat to have two tools doing the same thing just to increase coverage testing. And we both stolen kind of some ideas from each other as well. It's pretty neat. So the basic uh, how it works thing. So before you can call a system call and give it what it expects, you need to annotate every single system call that the kernel knows, all 300 and something of them. And you have to annotate every argument type. So say this is an expected in a length, this is an address, this is a file descriptor. And then I have a bunch of routines that hand those out. So on startup, uh, if first, the first thing it does is create a bunch of file descriptors. It creates uh, a bunch of network sockets. Uh, it pulls a bunch of files from slash dev, slash proc, slash sysfs. And um, over the lifetime of the, the tools running, it just hands those out randomly when it wants a file descriptor. There's a bunch of other things allocated as well, which I'll go into later. Um, and there's a shared memory map between all the children. This is the basic setup. You, have, you run the tool. It forks a main loop and a watchdog process, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And the main loop just keeps forking however many children as you have processes. And uh, if one of these dies, it respawns another one. So it just keeps continually spawning children as necessary. Um, this tends to need to happen because sometimes the children seg fault when they call certain system calls that are just too crazy. Um, the watchdog process keeps track of all the children, and uh, it'll send a sig kill if it's called a system call that's stuck, like if it's stuck in a read or it's stuck in something. Um, it 
does uh, some basic sanity checks on the uh, shared memory map between all the children, just to make sure that none of them are corrupting it and it's going completely crazy. Uh, these are the types that, um, that we know. Uh, so the most basic type we know is just arg random int and that returns rand, essentially. Uh, argfd is a file descriptor. Arg length is um, a random number that looks like a length. So a lot of the time, I'll just set like a high bit of um, a word. So it'll be, uh, sometimes we get interesting wraparound bugs. Uh, arg address and non null addresses, they return things like the return from malloc. So you get a page for the syscall to scribble on. Uh, arg pid will be one of the pids of the children. So crazy things happen sometimes when they want a pid and they all start fighting among each other, sending each other signals and all kinds of crazy things. Um, arg range is like rand, but it's like a, just a bounded range. Uh, arg op and arg list. Um, certain system calls have flags variables and they want certain bits set. These are just ways of specifying those bits. Arg op, op is just one of the bits gets set. Arg list, a random collection of bits gets set. Um, arg run page is literally a page full of just random garbage. Uh, arg CPU is a CPU number. Path name is one of the path names that we found on startup from sysfs procfs or slash dev. And then we have some other things like IOVEX and uh, stock address, which I'll go into later. So I have to keep, um, because there's so many different types that the, uh, that the system calls take, I have to keep adding special support for things like SOC address. Uh, and every time I add a new type, a whole bunch of other syscalls can then just inherit the support for that. I don't know why that isn't showing. Okay, we're gonna skip that. Um, so that was, the previous page did show a slide. Uh, actually, what I can do, hang on a second. I don't know why that slide was invisible, so I'll just pull up the source. So what was on that slide was basically the struct at the bottom here. And uh, every system call has one of these structs. So we have a name, which is in this case mmap. We have, it tells it the number of arguments. There's a pointer to a routine called sanitize, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and then there's a series of each of the arguments and their types. It's like the adder is, the, is an address, len is len, prot is a list, and the list is all these potential flags right here. And that's the basic thing. So every system call has one of these. Put that back. Um, the sanitize function, uh, sanitize pointer pointed to a function like this, where sometimes you want to special case certain things. Like for example, on mmap, uh, if it's an anonymous mapping, you don't want a file descriptor argument, so we put a minus one in there. And uh, we do some magic with aligning. So sometimes there's some special casing necessary, but not every system call has one of these sanitize routines. Um, instead of just passing rand, sometimes uh, we just need a random number. And instead of completely random numbers, we do some really sort of weird looking numbers. And uh, this is what I mentioned earlier, where it's, we were trying to get like off by ones and just like really strange looking numbers. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. And there's also some 64-bit variants of those, but they use addresses as well, including things like kernel addresses, kernel module addresses, the VDSO address. So there's a potential for all kinds of crazy things happening there. Uh, struct fabrication. So I mentioned earlier that I annotate certain um, structures. Like if a syscall takes a uh, sock adder, it needs to hand one out. And it picks um, one kind of at random, a random network protocol. Uh, in this case, this is a, an IPv4 SOC adder that it's generating. So it mallocs the right size, and it fills in something that kind of looks like a struct. It makes it look reasonable to what the kernel is expecting. Because what the kernel does as soon as you call a function that takes a SOC adder, it validates these things and says, well, the size that you passed in doesn't match this, the, uh, the length argument, so this is crazy and it'll just e-inval. So you have to get this something that looks semi-viable. Um, the only downside is this needs knowledge of every network protocol that the um, kernel knows, and that's a ton of work, but um, a lot of them have been done already. I still have some uh, extension to do, but some basic coverage. Uh, something else that it needs to do is be very careful about, uh, before it calls the system calls, it has to make sure it's not doing anything that will 
basically harm itself, like M unmapping the shared mem map between the children, for example, or um, anything which could just corrupt its own state. So there's a bunch of self-checks before it does the syscall to make sure that, they, that uh, addresses are in, you know, not in certain ranges. Um, yeah, we, uh, there's a bunch of things where we uh, trap a bunch of signals just to make sure that they don't um, confuse the children. That's about it. Uh, more problems. So one of the um, one of the problems I have uh, when I find a bug with this tool is I'll report into a kernel developing. Oh, that's this problem. They'll come up with a patch, and then usually you know that gets merged in the Linux tree. And uh, a lot of the time, I have a hard problem proving that the bug is actually being fixed. Um, the reason for this is sometimes the fuzz testing takes days before it'll actually hit that. Uh, other, th other um, reasons are if it's something like uh, a race condition or something, it's very hard sometimes to recreate the exact circumstances. So um, that's been one problem that I've faced. Um, another problem has been over sanitizing uh, some of the uh, arguments on the way in. Um, if we sanitize them too much, then the system calls are just going to succeed and nothing particularly awkward is going to happen. So what I have tend to do in a lot of cases is I'll randomly give them the right arguments, but not always. Uh, as you can see there, that's just a um, yeah, one in 10 chance. Uh, and some system calls call other systems calls, so you can syscall while you syscall, um, like socket call. And with these, we have, it's basically um, uh, not inheritance, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Recursive. It basically recurses into each other. You just have to make sure that you recurse pro and recurse properly after you return from the system call. Um, socket call is one of them. There was a few others, if I remember right. Um, another problem that it faces is after it's been running for a long time, um, a lot of kernel functions uh, allocate memory on the way in, and they expect you to, sh to release it at some point. Um, currently, there's no mechanism in the tool for deallocating anything that was allocated. So we tend to leak quite a bit of memory. And uh, an interesting side effect of this is sometimes we trigger the out of memory killer. Um, now, that's, it's all well and good, but what should happen in these cases is the OOM killer should kill the actual process that's just been doing this, uh, that's been doing all these allocations. But in, uh, in some of the uh, cases we've seen so far, that hasn't been the case. It's killed things like SSHD or send mail or something. That's very old Right, there's a score. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's just this bunch of heuristics, and it's very easy to confuse it. Um, so it's found a bunch of problems with those heuristics, and they've gotten slightly better as a result of this. So that's one thing that's come out of that. Um, one of the biggest problems that I face is after seeing, after hitting a bug, it would be nice if I can just reproduce that bug very quickly. And in some cases, the fuzzers literally run for two or three days before a bug has happened. So what I started doing was periodically reseeding the random number generator so I know what the seed was shortly before the bug was hit. The only problem is that it's not, still not guaranteed to give you a one-to-one -one reproducibility across two different runs. Um, one problem is you may sort of, within minutes of starting the fuzzer, corrupt some state, and that corrupt state may not actually be walked over until two days later when you're doing a different system call. Um, so if you're taking the seed from two days later, it's not going to matter because that state isn't um, corrupt. Um, so yeah, that's been a big problem. Uh, another problem is, uh, for example, when it starts up and reads all the file descriptors from, say, slash proc, no two runs are going to be the same because all the proc PID numbers are going to be different on two different runs. So um, I need to fix that, and I've got some ideas how I'm going to do that, but it uh, hasn't been done yet. It's mostly, um, when you do two runs and compare the output, they're mostly the same. It's just things like it hands out different FDs right now. So um, what are the results of this? So last year, it found over 150 bugs. Well, 
from my runs, other people have also been running this. Uh, there's a guy at Intel who has this enormous cluster of um, really fast machines that's um, constantly running this on Linux Next, and he's found even more of them. So it's definitely finding bugs. Um, when um, when code tends to get merged into Linux history or even straight into Linux Next, uh, it tends to find bugs in uh, in new code very quickly. So uh, we don't have to wait, you know, two days usually. Usually it breaks pretty fast. Um, and despite what I said in the previous slide, it's usually once you see one bug, you'll tend to hit that same bug over and over rather than finding different bugs. Um, as the last point says, they, they tend to mask other bugs, so you'll see one particularly nasty one first, and until that gets fixed, you won't get to see any of the others. Um, and it's not just system call code that is finding bugs in. It's found um, a ton of networking bugs. Um, and lots of the weirdo, um, like old protocols, like AX25 and weird ham radio stuff. Um, most of those things are unmaintained and kind of awful, so it was no surprise that there was a lot of bugs there. Uh, it's found some virtual memory bugs, um, especially in some of the lesser used system calls. Um, and it's found a handful of driver bugs. It's found a bunch of really old bugs. The oldest one I found dated back to 1996. This code hadn't changed at all in 16 years. Um, if you call sets, set sock opt with TCP options on a UDP socket, it would oops. And no one came across, no one stumbled across this in 16 years. So that got fixed recently. Um, it makes you wonder how many other bugs like that are just waiting that have been there for, you know, going on for 20 years. <coughs> um, the, uh, some of the VM bugs, like, uh, like the mem policy bugs, they were, um, there's a, there's a library that actually calls these, um, these syscalls, and most people that want to do this specific functionality, they go through that library. And the library gives it the arguments that it expects. It's never going to do anything too crazy. So for four years, anyone could have sent these syscall, system calls garbage and just oops the kernel immediately. Um, they were pretty bad. They were, that was the case of something like a, a switch statement, and the default case was a bug, so it would just panic. Um, yeah, that was pretty terrible. Uh, and yeah, the VM under stress, I mean, it, because it, the, the leaking thing I was mentioning just now, it uh, tends to find a lot of um, corner cases in the page allocator where, uh, especially after a while when it's fragmented uh, kernel memory, if it's been running for two days, your chances of getting large allocations drop dram dramatically. So when people want to do things like you know, 64K chunks of contiguous memory, it's pretty unlikely it's going to happen once memory's been that fragmented. So there's been a load of those bugs that's found. Um, we had a security fix in one of the system calls. And while we were preparing an update for one of the Fedora, um, up, uh, Fedora releases, we were running this tool on it and I thought, well, let's tell it to just do that system call that just got patched. And uh, within an hour, it actually found another problem. So it was a security fix that actually needed another security fix. Um, lots and lots of uh, error path memory leaks. I mean, a lot of this code just never gets tested. It's, um, and it's not just memory leaks, it's things like uh, missing unlocks in uh, error paths. Error paths are just very poorly tested. Um, the bottom example there, broken locks. Uh, when someone removed the big kernel lock from, um, uh, from all the network protocols and replaced them with spin locks, there was a case where all you had to do was mod probe a certain uh, network protocol or even just create a socket with that protocol and it would oops immediately because there was an unbalanced locking thing. Just from mod probing the module, so that had been patched and clearly no one had ever even mod probed the module afterwards to test it. Um, there's some really scary things that it's found as well. Um, my previous laptop, um, actually the second part, I'll go with the first one first. Uh, sometimes when I see a bug that looks too weird, until I actually see the same bug on another machine, sometimes I'm actually questioning whether the hardware is at fault or it's actually a real bug. Um, because uh, there's definitely been some cases where um, 
the CPU has been overheating or there's just been some bad memory or something. And uh, those kind of things tend to show up very quickly when you're running stress tests. Uh, the second problem, uh, SMI handles. Uh, I had a laptop that um, when you gathered all the, the proc files and what have you on startup, one of those was the, um, the AC, one of the ACPI files to read the current battery state. And when you read this battery file, it triggered uh, an SMI uh, system management interrupt. And there was something terribly wrong with this SMI code. It's all completely invisible to the OS. But uh, the long story short, the battery died. <laughs> it, um, if you read, if you kept reading the same file fast enough, uh, the SMI handler, I think, just couldn't cope with that uh, flood of interrupts and, uh, well, bad things happened. Um, so that, that was actually uh, still under warranty, so I got a battery replacement, and uh, then I did it again. <laughs> and that confirmed my thesis that it was actually, this was what was happening. So uh, yeah, I destroyed two batteries. So I don't recommend always running it on the laptop, on the laptop, even though I'm about to do that at the end of this, <laughs> just to demo it. Um, not just kernel bugs. Uh, this is a real fun thing. So one of the this uh, parameter here, um, dash c exec v means just call exec v and no other sys calls. Dash v is um, a feature I call victim files, and I'm, I I came up with this idea because I wanted to do things like. Uh, what happens if I have a bunch of files, say, on an NFS mount, and instead of reading file descriptors from slash dev on startup, read them from the NFS mount, so then we do some weird stuff with NFS. That was the original intention. But uh, just for fun, I decided to feed it slash bin one time, and uh, this is what happens when you do that. So what you should be watching is the bottom window. All these things that are just randomly seg folding. These are, whoa. <laughs> let's, let's, let's stop that. Um, so, uh, so if I now do file temp call. <laughs> That's just from like a 30 second run, all these things just side faulted. And it's calling exactly on these binaries with just garbage as a parameter. So it could be just incredibly long parameter and it's overflowing it. They all tend to be pretty much the same kind of bug, but uh, yeah, everything slash bin is terrible. <laughs> so that was um, a fun sort of thing that I wasn't expecting to happen. Um, but uh, yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the kind of thing that it does now. Um, so what are the, uh, it's a lot of work just maintaining what I have so far. So every time a new system call gets added upstream, I have to add support for that system call. Uh, only 10% of the system calls that I currently have have sanitized routines. Some of them could probably use at least a basic one. Uh, they're not always needed, but uh, sometimes you can just improve um, the chances of the system call getting further into the function. Um, more struct fabrication, like the sock adder um, thing that I was doing. Um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, types that the kernel is expecting that we just don't, right now we're just passing, passing garbage rather than realistic looking structures. And uh, things like that sock adder struct fabrication, that needs even more extension for uh, finishing off the uh, remaining network protocols. There's only a few left, like Bluetooth and a few others. And every time a flag gets added to um, a system call, I have to add that to the relevant flag lists. Um, more fun things that I want to do is uh, right now, if you give it no parameters, it'll literally call these uh, system calls completely in a random order. And no realistic program actually does this. Um, what I would like to do is um, an idea I call system called chains, where patterns of what realistic programs look like they do, like they open a file descriptor, maybe they read from it, maybe they close it. Um, so I have a chain of three different system calls there, and I do these little clusters. And that's something I'm going to experiment with just to see if that um, makes anything fun happen. 
destructors is something I need to have them for all the allocations so we don't leak so much memory, memory when we run. And uh, root mode. Um, there's a bunch of system calls that uh, will just You'll get EPIRM as soon as you call them because they only expect to be run by root. Um, some of them you can't really fuzz because things like shut down, well, you're going to fuzz it and then your laptop will shut down, so that's going to be pretty pointless. Um, but some of the others um, but, um, will set up uh, some kind of state that only root is allowed to do. That's something that uh, we could possibly get into. Uh, and Ioctl. I cannot say enough bad things about Ioctl. Um, so right now, the support for the IOctal syscall is pretty lame. It doesn't do a huge amount. It's not going to really find any bugs with what I have. Uh, the problem with IOctal is just it's a terrible interface. Um, the bits highlighted in red there, as you see, the second argument is a device-dependent request code. So the request, um, if, if we fabricate one of those, we have to um, make sure that actually matches the right uh, file descriptor. And uh, they can be shared between different um, different types of drivers as well. Uh, the third argument, it could be anything. We have no idea what that is until we annotate every single IOCL or the ones we care about. So what I've done with Cisco so far for the last few years, I now need to do with all the IOCLs. So that's a massive job that I've been putting off, but um, I'm going to have to get around to that soon. Um, the last point, uh, it's similar to the struct fabrication for things like sock adders. It, IOctal takes these just opaque structures, and uh, I'm just going to have to manufacture something that looks kind of like one of those for every single IOctal. Awful interface. Don't use it. Uh, so that's pretty much all the slides. So, um, so I showed you uh, the fun user space thing. So if I just run it with, if I run it with no arguments, uh, actually it's sort of quiet. So what we see here is starts up and uh, creates a bunch of sockets, and now it's creating, looking for files in slash dev, and some about 25,000 files in proc. And, and it's, there it goes, it's running. So it's thousands and thousands of these, these are happening, and there's crazy stuff going on down here already. I don't know what's all this. Um, from before. So as it's um, running across various network uh, protocols now, these are being loaded, so it's just triggered the VLAN support. Uh, that's probably just going to keep running. Oh, it's done there. Uh, we just tried to do an allocation bigger than what kmalloc can actually do. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm just going to leave that running. We'll see what happens, and I'll take questions while that's doing its thing. <laughs> Okay, ten minutes. Uh, Willie. Uh, what about F control? Well, it's another one of these. Um, F control is another one of these uh, ridiculous multiplexing one. I was just wondering if you add support for F control as well. Yeah, um, actually, off the top of my head, I don't remember what I've done for so far. So let's take a quick look. Um, because, as Willie points out, F control is another multiplex system call. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's very basic. It literally just picks a bunch of the, the flags and just feeds that down. Probably not going to do a huge amount of interesting things. Um, fix me needs to mutate some. I don't even know. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's F Kindle. Needs work. Uh, James. So you mentioned the crazy guy. Wu Feng Wang is the crazy guy from Intel. That's what he uses. So he's, u he's using this already. So my subsystem Maybe. <laughs> or maybe I just haven't done uh, the SCSI octals yet. <laughs> I'll come back to you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, how do you deal with port hardware that you don't have? Um, well, it's a, it's a how do I deal with hardware I don't have? Um, the bugs that it tends to find is the, the generic code that's not device specific. Um, for, hard, for hardware specific things, it literally is whatever it finds on the machine it's running on. So, um, like if, if a certain bug needs you know, a Bluetooth interface to be brought up before you know, it's going to trigger that bug, it, it's only going to happen on obviously things with Bluetooth hardware. So, 
badly, I guess, is the answer to your question. Um, there's no real good answer. Virtualization is kind of, you know, it would be nice if there was a, you know, a suite of virtualized devices and I could just pull from those, but they tend to only emulate you know, a handful of devices anyway. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have a microphone. Um, so, oddly enough, with a database server, we do funny fuzz testing. Um, and we've got to the point, there's two bits that may be useful to add to this. One of which is we have uh, a random query generator that you give a grammar to. So you instruct sort of what parts of stanzas of queries and what types of queries and what frequency to do. And then you have a program that then generates queries that fit this grammar. So that may work with the idea of chaining syscalls, um, basically then writing a grammar and then columns and you can adjust sort of frequency and what in order and have other snippets through that that can get a bit generic. And then you have the whole art form of actually writing those grammars. Um, but they've, they've found them pretty useful for us to especially interrogate specific parts where it's like, okay, now uh, try join or something like that. What, what database is that? Uh, it, it'll actually run about on anything. The project is called Rangen. Okay. Um, yeah, I can. Um, can you give me a pointer to it later? Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Um, and the other part it does is uh, uh, because the, well, MySQL specifically was so damn buggy and seg faulted all the time, the QA guy writing the code got sick of filing bugs uh, with longer things, so wrote stuff to do sort of automatic bisecting down to the minimal mm. sort of test case. Uh, and then, because you could trigger it like, oh, when it called up, it's it. So maybe like you can start to. Yeah. The guy at Intel that. who's running this on some huge cluster is doing something like that with the bisecting. Yeah. It's very, uh, very useful. Yeah. Oh, so this is um, just kind of verbose mode. So you can see it's actually, these are the system calls it's actually doing and uh, the various arguments. It's kind of there mostly for me to sanity check what it's actually passing down so I can take a look and uh, make sure it's not doing anything wrong. So just leave that running. Next. Yeah, David, you mentioned the complexities of IOCTAL and so on. One of the things you might be able to take advantage of is the fact that the IOCTAL definitions themselves actually have the structure that's passed to them in the definition of the IOCTAL. Um, the, the IOR or IOWR uh, defines, uh, give the, the number, the, the identifier, and then the struct that is supposed to be passed to it. Hmm. Um, so you should be able to parse the actual header files that define all the IOPLs and work out what the structure is actually passed to as that completely untyped void pointer. I still stand by my assertion that it's an awful interface. <laughs> um, in the kernel, I think that there are uh, probably more bugs in the drivers. And, uh, you know, for example, network drivers, we've had major problems with the bonding driver with 10 gig and BE2 net mm -hmm. uh, driver um, just locking up. And um, I guess the fuzzing input to drivers somehow would be um, some kind of uh, wonderful thing if it were possible to actually generate some kind of random input to uh, these mm. particularly network devices because so it, it, so it comes back to the same problem um, all these interfaces are all ioctal based so and, and once I have some basic structure for fuzzing ioctals this should just fall out um, anything like um, when you for example if you mentioned bridging just creating a bridge is a, like three or four ioctals when you pass you know the interfaces in and it uh, so once I've got bonding, uh, bonding sorry, not uh, bridging. Um, so uh, it should just eventually happen. It just needs to sit down and write the code. I hope. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you found bugs uh, like missing unlocks on error paths and things like uh, memory leaks. Is that something you're auto-detecting, or are you observing that while the tool is running? Um, the bulk of them actually were found by another guy who was running the tool, and he was using the kernel's memory leak detector. If you boot with kmem leak equals on, as long as you've built that in, um, then it maintains a list of allocations over time. And he ran it for a while, then killed the fuzzer, and then saw what was still you know, unreferenced and, uh, and actually leaked. Yes, um, locked up is finding all the locking problems. That's uh, that blows up very quickly. Okay. Sorry, I've got a really simple, stupid question. But if you do come across something which totally kills the machine, what uh -huh. locking have you got to find out what that was? Um, 
The only time I've actually had bugs where it's completely wedged the machine, I've usually been able to get something out over serial, so I managed to get a trace. But um, thankfully, those bugs are few and far between. Uh, another um, thing that's been useful is uh, there's a kernel option called page alloc debug, and sometimes that finds a lot of those bugs, and you, you'll get an actual oops or a GPF rather than a locked up machine. One more. So you normally run this as, you said you have your root mode, um, normally it's run as a normal user to avoid hardware destruction, or, I mean, I can imagine random syscalls all over your disk could be a little... Yeah, bad idea, really bad idea to run it as root on a, um, unless you're running it in a VM, which uh, there's actually a guy at Oracle that that's how he runs it all the time, as root in a VM, and he finds all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, a lot of them are kind of, um, your root, you can do anything. You know, you've got a gun, you've just blown off your foot, essentially. <laughs> uh, but some of them are, I mean, there's in no circumstance for the kernel loops, regardless of what user you are. So, um, yeah, some of these are real bugs. Uh, what happens when some process goes to sleep, for example, waiting for data in a pipe or similar? Is it get killed or waits for a random wake up? Um, we send a sick kill, but if it's blocking, then it's just going to, you know, it's, just, it's not going to wake up because it's in D state. So um, there are cases where it will actually just eventually wedge if, it's, if everything ends up in D state. Uh, I've tried to add some code to actually prevent doing things like that. So if, if one process reads from a file descriptor and then gets wedged, I blacklist that file descriptor and say don't read from this again because that's likely to lock us up. So there's a few little self-defense measures like that. But yeah, the watchdog is actually, uh, that'll just send kills when it thinks something hasn't, if, if it hasn't made any progress, and hasn't made any further system calls in 30 seconds, it'll send a SIG kill. Some of us happen to believe that is in itself a bug, that a, a, a process should always be killable. But Wouldn't that, it be uh, nice? That's <laughs> a giant fight that perhaps we don't want to have right now. It would be nice. Hmm. And things like um, NFS servers going away and everything just wedging, yeah, that would be nice to have solved. <laughs> okay, that's all we have time for. Um, thank you, Dave, for the talk. Thanks.